Welcome to episode 207 of the Necronama.com. Throughout the month of October, author and editor Alex Woodrow is joining us as we take a deep dive into Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. Today's episode is Graveyard Rats. I guess we might as well start by saying that this um, episode was directed by Vincenzo Natali. Yes. Right? I don't, mm-hmm. I'm not actually sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hopefully it's not too far off. And the teleplay, not only did he direct this one, I think he actually wrote the teleplay mm-hmm. based nice. on this much older story by Henry Kuttner. I'm definitely not pronouncing that one right, though. And Fantastic. yeah, Vincenzo Natali is our big star for this one. And if, if you're not already familiar with his works, anybody who's listening, he did In the Tall Grass and he did mm-hmm. Splice. Uh, we have an yeah. episode on Splice that, that we've covered. And um, uh, I'm sure that we'll get to In the Tall Grass sooner mm-hmm. or later. If somebody oh, I mean, I mean, oh gosh, he did, he did Cube, right? He did yeah, oh Cube. yeah, yeah, Cube. Cube. Which is, oh, man. has always been one of my favorite things. It's interesting that he actually has done a bunch of sci-fi horror, if you think about it, which is mm-hmm. what this episode is fundamentally not. Right. <laughs> like, absolutely <laughs> not even remotely that. Wow, that's pretty interesting, yeah. And, uh, I, wonder, and... I wonder if that was deliberate. I wonder if he got prompted or he prompted himself, you know what, let's do something that's way out of the comfort zone. That would be fun. And if you're a person who truly loves Splice, on our T Public site, we even have some merch inspired by that movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, um, Alex, we'll let you kick off again. You're back again. We're excited that you're here all month. Thank uh, you. Let's jump in. Love tell it. me, tell me what you love about this one. Well, okay, first of all, I have to address this, right? This whole thing, this whole episode is set in and around and under and above and sideways of cemeteries, right? A, a cemetery. And it immediately me- makes me feel so amused at us. Because if you think about it, we are presenting, not we, well, the episode is presenting disinterment, right? And stealing from the dead as horror. The setting is presented as scary and horrific. The actions are presented as being pretty horrible. To a horror audience, which technically we should be pretty comfortable around graveyards by now. Like largely Mm -hmm. most of us don't have any particular issues there. When you think about it, the horror of disinterment and stealing from the dead is very much tied to religion. Not just Christianity, but I think for most of us at this point, that's sort of where it comes from. Which I think, you know, again, a lot of the audience probably isn't even necessarily strictly going to still have those beliefs. So it does raise the question of why do we still find the idea of disinterment so horrific that it's still part of our sort of artistic and cultural background? And I know that this might just be my cultural bias talking because I do come from a place where we have a whole list of reasons why we might disinter somebody, right? Some Mm. of them practical, some of them superstitious, some of them really wild. So it's a practice that I see it on the screen and I'm like, yeah, disinterring people, that's normal. That's that's a Tuesday, that's fine. (laughs) But I realize that on some level, I'm supposed to find it horrifying. And that just really fascinates me. It makes me wonder, like, who is it that actually finds it horrifying and why specifically? When you don't tie it to religion, right? When you don't have some mythical figure telling you that you are going to hell for doing it, what other Mm -hmm. reasons are there for finding it so weird and scary? What other reasons are there for finding cemeteries scary? Is it just that horror keeps telling us they are? Like, are we single-handedly doing this to people now? I mean, I think that part of it is probably just the fear of death overall, right? right. Like you have to literally look at death in a in a cemetery, uh, especially if you're grave robbing. You will definitely look directly at death. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. For me, the the bigger horror in this is the claustrophobia and and the mm-hmm. six thousand rats. But um, 
and not so much the weird thing yelling mine constantly, but that's, that's kind of <laughs> freaky too. Uh, Don, what do you got? Oh man, I've, I, I've got a good bit. Um, I, I think the, the thing that would probably disturb you aside from seeing death, like the face of death and, and, and its existence its reality is the idea that you, you have to confront your own mortality with that. Mm-hmm. Um, they're probably the only time I probably was freaked out by the presentation of of death cinematically was with uh, Black Mirror's episode San Junipero, where you know oh, one of the characters dies and oh, they're yeah. playing um, Heaven is a Place on Earth and they're oh, dropping yeah. the casket. And that moment, like I had a mini panic attack because I was like, "Oh shit!" They're they're presenting it in a very realistic way. You know, in, in mm-hmm. a in a way, it's like. You know, it's not comical. It's not. It's not presented. You know, like uh, mm-hmm. what is death at a funeral? We're not pre- mm-hmm. presenting it in a funny way. We're not presenting it in a really dark and grim way. We're not having this as something that's going to drive the story. Like you yeah. know, this guy's mentor dies and he's at a funeral and he gives a speech. You know, it's it's kind of like it's solemn, dark, and real at this, or realistic at the same mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think you know when it comes to digging up the dead for the sake of robbing them you have that new level of creep i guess is the best way uh, you know the, to describe this where you're not even respecting somebody in their final resting place like mm-hmm. there are two places where you know i should say really just one place where you're the safest the the place where you expect nothing to take place is a graveyard yeah and Somebody, I can't remember if it was my dad or somebody I was I was talking about uh, graveyard cemeteries with one time. And that fear, that irrational fear that we have of it doesn't make sense because no one is going to bother you in a cemetery. Mm-hmm. I mean, as far as like the people that are interred there, no yeah. one is going to bother you. No one's going to reach out of the ground. And it's like the when people have a fear of the dark. It's not that fear of the dark. It's the fear that you're alone. I'm sorry, that you're not alone in the dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the same thing with the cemetery. It's the fear that something could happen. It's not. Yeah. In a place where it's possible. good. Yeah. Exactly. But something could. But when it comes to these people who are robbing, it, it's, it's you, you feel as though these are people that are worse than your average robber, even though they're technically not hurting anybody physically. Yeah, it's that's the thing. I, if you think about it, they are technically not causing harm. No. I mean, if anything, that would be causing harm to the family that discovers their loved one has been dug up. But I always, I, I think of it as strange. I mean, it's strange from my perspective. As far as the, the practice of burying, mm-hmm. as far as the ceremony that, that we, we put along to it. But more so than that, when you hand over valuables and put them into the into the grave with that person. You know, their rings, their jewelry, things like that. Um, you know, I find that strange, not in, in a disrespectful way as far as like my my attributing it as being strange, just kind of like, I think that's, it's interesting. It's, mm-hmm. it's peculiar, but it it's what curious. people are going to do. Yeah, but, it's an interesting practice and we have it too. Not with valuables though, in our funeral traditions, like we have mm-hmm. a lot of them and we are very tied to funeral traditions. And in ours, you would put practical things that you would want this person to have wherever they are going forward. Mm. So like you would, um, you know, give your young daughter who passed away a hand mirror and a comb and buttons. Or, you know, you would give your husband his favorite beer mug and his comfortable shoes. So, like they are things that are meaningful. It's not valuables in the like gold sense, but valuables mm-hmm. to the person. And I, I do think it would totally have the same sort of effect for having those removed it's like they're there because you want them to be with this person wherever they are it doesn't matter how this person will use them those practical things don't matter it's because right. you wanted them to be there forever and for them to have them and then suddenly they don't anymore and that does feel like a, a weird sort of hole where there shouldn't have been one mm-hmm well, and, and even with the 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 digging them up uh, and, you know, exhuming bodies, things like that, you know, we typically do it for scientific reasons or criminal reasons. Mm-hmm. Like we have to do an autopsy on this body. We <laughs> have to make sure that do a DNA test like Salvador we Dali's. Vampires. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> like Salvador Dali's one. What, you know, he he got exhumed for a paternity test 
And when mm-hmm. they exhumed him, they they discovered that his mustache was still perfectly mm-hmm. waxed and curled. Uh, but then there are cultures um, in Indonesia and, and the Philippines and probably a few other places where yearly they dig up their their past relative or their their relatives who've passed and friends and things like that and put on new clothing for them or put Aww. new clothing on their bodies. Oh God, that's to- so sweet. Yeah, they take pictures with them and and mm-hmm. uh, often, be, you know, all, all, you know, different types of food and drinks mm-hmm. and things like that. And then rebury them. And I was mm-hmm. just like, that's actually kind of a it's a cool tradition, but it's also a way of removing that idea of you need to be scared of death. Yeah, yeah. Um, it does remove because you have people of all ages participating. Yeah, absolutely. I think we do that a lot in Romania, too. I mean, it is traditional. It, it doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, but yeah, well, they would take pictures with the person who is about to be buried, you know, and um, I do have pictures like that from my family. I probably find them a little bit creepy because I'm, you know, born a little too late for that tradition. But everybody mm-hmm. from my parents upwards had, doesn't even bat an eyelash at having those pictures. Um, so, yeah, we do that, too. And we do a lot of that stuff where we sort of try to take away that separation between the living and the dead. <laughs> There's a lot of intercultural communication going on <laughs> between our two realms, which I, I think definitely colors my perspective on this movie a lot. Well, you so know, I, I have the... a real, I, I was just going to say, I have a real question for you, Don, and I want to mm-hmm. know your real thoughts on this. I'm not just being funny. Oh, damn it. Where is the line God, God, between it. grave robbing and archaeology. You knew what, I like, was going there. You knew I was going there. I had my but, next thing, but I'm, British Museum. Seriously. Amazing. Yeah. No, and that's my thing. I, I'm not talking about people who are legitimately researching and trying to learn. I, I'm talking about things like the museum you just mentioned, like mm. taking things from pharaohs or, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, where yeah. is the line between the two? Uh, it normally comes with a master's or a PhD. That becomes the line between um, archaeology and grave robbing. I know. I'm not like, sure. Like I, 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 count. I loved, and I still do. I love Indiana Jones. I loved mm-hmm. it as a kid. Loved it as an mm-hmm. adult. But when you get older, you start realizing, like, oh my god, yeah, Indy's like not a good guy. He's not a bad guy. But he's not a good guy because he's going mm-hmm. and, you know, into all these different cultural, you know, uh, the, these different cultures and violating different people's cultural traditions and and then going in and with this belongs in the museum. And I'm like, no, mm-hmm. maybe it belongs where it was. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it belongs exactly where it was. I mean, there's definitely an easy line somewhere, because at some point when it is for scientific study, when it is for research, when we have practical reasons for needing to know this information to -hmm. preserve parts of history, absolutely easy decision. That's pure archaeology, not grave robbing, not Mm -hmm. weird or wrong in any way. But then we definitely also call it archaeology when it's just for display purposes. Right. And then people will say like, oh, but it's for the people. I'm like, no, somebody's making money off of that, just so we're clear. Yep. Like, just so Mm -hmm. we're completely clear, somebody somewhere whose name you don't even know is making a killing. So. Absolutely. Or at the very least, they paid a lot for it and then had it appraised way higher and got a huge mm-hmm. tax cut donating it. So they made money somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've got, you know, you you got a history of colonialism, imperialism that gets wrapped, no pun intended, that gets wrapped up into looking for <laughs> mummies and, and, and uh, stuff like that to where it makes it a whole lot easier where you can take advantage of, you know, through your alliances with a country, mm-hmm. your, your relationship to where it's like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to go and exhume these bodies um, and put them on display. Mm-hmm. You've got, you've got pushback from a lot of places. I think, um, I can't remember it was Benin or or another country that was asking for the British Museum to return the artifacts as well as the French museums to return the artifacts or at least lease them mm-hmm. uh, or at least develop a leasing relationship, which, again, that would make total sense. Hey, we got this from Egypt. We got this from Benin. We got this from Togo. We got this from Uganda, Kenya, wherever you happen to get it from. We're going to lease it out as part of a cultural exchange where mm-hmm. here. You get these mummies, you could put them on display, 
proceeds are going to support your museum, but they're also going to help, I don't know, colleges, food programs, something like back in the, the country that it's from, you know, boost tourism, something. But for the longest time, it was simply, oh, we found this. We're taking it with us. Oh, we found this. We know it's actually part of this country, but we're going to take it with us. Um, and even more recently, you saw that with with the Iraq war, uh, where people here weren't didn't really pay that much attention to it. But you had grave robbing and archaeological robbing as well, where uh, I think even the people associated with who owned Hobby Lobby or associated with Hobby Lobby were taking and taking artifacts from Iraq or paying people to, to send them artifacts from Iraq and, and engaging in all types of illegal smuggling. Well, smuggling is illegal. <laughs> engaging in all types of smuggling <laughs> of these artifacts, you know, basically so they could make money off of it. And people were surprised that, you know, a business would do something like that. What I say, any business, any human could could be potentially do mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I would just like to add one thing, though. If the British Museum does decide to lease out some of these artifacts, like if they have Dacian artifacts that they would like to lease back to us, they definitely should because we are absolutely going to give them back. A hundred percent. You don't need to worry. We are totally going to give them back after after the <laughs> lease is over. We are so going to. We pinky promise. <laughs> I just want somebody to, to go to Westminster Abbey mm. or or, uh, or the House of Parliament where they, they have some, you know, Winston Churchill and I think Margaret Thatcher mm-hmm. are, are interred there and just go there with a shovel and see, oh, how, yeah. the British, <laughs> see how the British respond. Oh, like, yeah. Hey, hey, I'm studying your people. <laughs> Clank. It's I'm fine. protecting your history. If I yes. don't deserve it, you're not going to. It belongs in a museum. <laughs> You guys put them in the ground. Why would you do that? That museum just happens to be somewhere in Eastern Europe, you know, but it's a museum. <laughs> I love it. No, it is fine. This is a really great question with the, the, the distinction and w- whether grave robbing is actually harming anybody. And I think in this specific case, in the episode, we were talking earlier about how it might cause harm to the families, but because mm-hmm. the main character who does it is actually the, the um, is it curate? What is the name? Uh, of the caretaker. Book? Caretaker. Thank you. The caretaker of the graveyard. The thing is, he is putting them back good as new at the end, like for sure. Every day, everything looks spotless and perfect mm-hmm. because otherwise he wouldn't be able to continue doing this. So technically, the families have no idea that this is happening. And they will never know, which again raises the interesting question. Is it still causing harm if they never know about it? Well, that's the old, you know, if a tree falls in a forest yeah. type situation. And I don't I don't say that facetiously. I mean, if if you are not aware of the harm, have you been harmed? Yeah. Um, I would say in a philosophical sense, yes. Yes, agreed. It, it, and there are contexts in which absolutely, even in a practical sense, but I think there mm-hmm. are specific small contexts in which the answer is no, realistically no. Right. And I would Ooh, say I would I would completely agree as far as like if you go in and I went and I was able to get that sword that King George gave, you know, mm-hmm. your your father, your husband, whatever, you would never know. Mm-hmm. You would never know unless like the son decided. Screw you, mom. Screw dad's wishes. I'm going to get an excavator and go out there and, and dig up dad. Oh, my mm-hmm. God. His body's gone. But at that point, the what? son has already made some decisions that were technically. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Yeah, I guess it, it it can be iffy for generations further down the line. It can be iffy for historians down the line, maybe. That could be a real harm. Because it does mean that eventually we're going to end up with people who are excavating these sites for a reason and are not going to find what they're supposed to find or mm-hmm. you know they're going to find an artifact somewhere else and not even be able to explain it right. um, although i wonder whether that's going to be an issue a thousand years from now like are people start going to be looking at our remains and trying to explain what the fuck we were doing <laughs> or are they just nah. going to give up on us entirely and just go nah. no we know have our twitter feeds uh yeah Elon we know will, enough. we'll leave we it somewhere for them we don't and, uh, need they'll to just know that we were really angry. Yeah, we don't need to see <laughs> what the, the writing on their uh, mug said. It's so, fine. 
So just to just to play devil's advocate for a second, what where does property come into this? Like, if this guy is the caretaker, that doesn't necessarily make him the owner. But let's say on an owner mm-hmm. level of the cemetery, you don't own, like you own the right to put a body in a plot, but you don't own that plot. You can't like go do anything you want to it because it's your property. So at what point does grave robbing also become like I own the graveyard, so I own everything in it, right? Oh, like well, possession is nine tenths of the law, or whatever, or you yeah. know that kind of shit. Yeah, and and obviously I'm I'm speaking from an American point of view because I don't know everybody else's rules, but yeah, go ahead. I don't know how it is for you guys, what the rules would be, what the law says, but here and I think in a lot of the adjoining countries, it's literally just a storage space. <laughs> Harkening back to our previous episode, so you are yeah. renting the space out, and you do have the right to use it as a storage space, obviously with limitations, because also you couldn't go to a storage space and live in there if you wanted to. Like that's a rule; you can't do that. So you couldn't rent out the grave plot and put your tent on it and live there. But it is a storage space that you are renting, and it does count as yours. So technically, <clears throat> in terms of property, yes, that is your property. In as much well, as anything you rent is your property temporarily. I would say, James, to the, the issue wouldn't even come down to property as far as like who's claiming the property. Uh, because we're talking about anything that gets done to a dead body. Mm-hmm. You then, depending on the state, uh, you can be charged with a felony for, um, I think in some places it might be a misdemeanor, but I'm just going to say felony, uh, mm-hmm. for violating um, a dead body. I, I can't mm-hmm. remember the exact term mm-hmm. for it, but you can actually be charged with with that. Dese- desecration of a, of, a, mm-hmm. of a corpse, desecration of a, of a, of a deceased person. Um, so even if it's, I'm going to go in here and rob, the fact that you dug them up without... A, a, a permit or without permission, you know, as far as like you're exhuming the body as part of a criminal case, you are then, um, I mean, the same, the, the same way if, if, if you were on a road trip, somebody died and you just dumped their bodies on the side of the road, they had a heart attack, get out of here, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same <laughs> thing. You do anything to, to desecrate a dead body, whether it was you digging them up or you just did not properly dispose of them. you, you face criminal charges. I feel like you guys probably enforce those laws a lot more than we do because we do still have like rural areas are going to dig people up because they suspect they're, they, they're, they're undead. <laughs> so like, that's all it takes. They will just do it. They're not asking for permission from anybody. So I do, I, the law definitely exists. You're not technically allowed to do that, but it's not necessarily as heavily enforced outside of cities as one would imagine. Right. But I suspect that you guys probably really seri- take those rules very seriously over there. Everything you tell me makes me want to just come and hang out in Romania. This sounds <laughs> amazing. Oh, you, need to, you need to visit. You need It's so interesting. <laughs> Uh, Universal healthcare, high speed trains. I mean, just don't die while you're here, or you <laughs> might get exhumed and have really interesting things done to your body. Yeah, we'll this, give you a plot for free, than I'm... But, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's that's uh, probably more fun than I'm having now. So sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you the plot, but there might be some fine print. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go, Don. If I buy a cemetery, I just have to put that I can take stuff out of the graves in the fine print because nobody reads that stuff. <laughs> it's true. And it's like so the service. And then I can be an archaeologist. License agreement. Yes. I can be an, <laughs> I can I can be a local <laughs> archaeologist. I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that was amazing. Sorry for what? That was great. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> oh, That's gosh. kind of our thing. Although one thing I didn't want to talk about that I found super fun is that the whole sort of like death and burial cult- culture, right, and cemetery culture in media is so anglicized that I find it incredibly familiar. An episode like this, like I know mm-hmm. all of the beats and I know the venue and I know all of everything that's going on there and the rituals and the digging and all of that and the lowering of the casket. Even though technically all of that should be wildly unfamiliar to me, like it's not exactly the same way that we do things. That's not my culture. I shouldn't really find it so familiar. 
And yet the moment the episode starts, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know this is my zone. I know exactly where we are. <laughs> and I found that a really fun effect. I, I have experienced that sort of thing before with other things where I'm like, this isn't even remotely my culture. But because English media is so prevalent and has been since I was born in this country, it kind of became an alternative version of my culture. And I okay. totally know what's about to happen. Um, and I was wondering whether that's something that would you know, sort of be an effect for most English speaking horror audiences is that you see a cemetery and again, you have that feeling of comfort, like we were talking about in the previous episode, comfort, familiarity, I know this setting, I know this zone, I know what's going to happen, I know the moods, and I'm kind of ready for the adventure now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but it strikes me like you were saying, like the media is so pervasive. I, I bet this happens all the time, like to the level that we, we don't even think about it at all. Yeah. That's fascinating. I'm going to need you to start a blog and uh, and record all that. No, I'm kidding. But uh, but I, I do find this absolutely fascinating. I love it. Because that's the thing. If you set it in this sort of classic English speaking co concept of burial and grave, it's familiar and comfortable. People know what they're dealing with. So they will immediately be ready to move on to the story itself. Right. right to mm -hmm. the person, what they're doing, what they're struggling with, what's happening. Whereas if I tried to set the same story in a traditional Romanian graveyard, everybody would get so stuck on how different it is that we would have to like process that part. The story would become about that rather than allow it to just move on super quickly past that and go into the rest of the story. I just thought that was a really fun effect. I guess I sort of have that with time. Like, if I see something set in the Victorian era, mm -hmm. I, I don't even know if it's accurate. You know, like, mm -hmm. I don't have any real concept of what's actually accurate, but I've seen it portrayed this certain way mm -hmm. my entire life. So much, to the yeah. point that as soon as it starts, I know where we're at. Yeah. I know I know all this stuff. I know there's chamber pots. I know, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> and And I'm sure a lot of it's accurate, but I'm saying there's probably stuff that's absolutely not that's just been handed down for generations oh, for now sure. i would love to have like this sort of clash because i have the same feeling with that sort of whole period to have the confrontation between what we are imagining that like what we know is there and is happening mm -hmm. as opposed to the reality of it like that would be fun to see at one point mm -hmm. man I'm going to be thinking about this for weeks now. Anyway. We haven't uh, even gotten into the movie yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, let's let's jump in and, and roll with it. It's, uh, I don't know. What do, what do you love most about this, Alex? Like, uh, is it the grave robbing? Is it the rats? Is it <laughs> the claustrophobia? I, I love that this is definitely going to target specific people. I'm not claustrophobic at all, like not even remotely. So there are certain effects of this episode that just, go right over my head and I don't feel them but I can easily identify how somebody who is like this is going to give them nightmares they are not going to right. be happy are, are either of you heavily claustrophobic I'm not um there are sometimes when like small spaces may bother me but it's it's mm -hmm. it's whatever else is going on like being in this situation it wouldn't be the going through the tunnels it would be the idea that the rats are there as well mm -hmm. so like I've I've yeah taken MRI so many times mm -hmm. uh, I've been in that tube where I'm like all right let's just go ahead and close our eyes and go to sleep that's what <laughs> yeah. I, where is I everyone where thinks is there... I'm weird because I sleep in there really huh. yeah. yeah but you know there's not going to be any rats in an MRI machine it, exactly <laughs> hopefully although that's a story somebody should be writing <laughs> um no the thing I would add to that is I'm not exactly claustrophobic. Like small spaces don't bother me, but mm -hmm. if it's a small ish space and then there's a ton of people in it, uh, that's the claustrophobia yeah. I have. Mm -hmm. And I, I right. don't even know if that's actually claustrophobia, but that's when it gets to me. It's all of this mm -hmm. unpredictability of other people and they're randomly moving, even if it's a little tiny bit. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, like, like one of the elevators in Vegas is a triangular shaped elevator that's in the uh, the Eiffel Tower version they have mm -hmm. there. And if I did it on my own, wouldn't bother me at all, even though it's small. Yeah. It would just be fine or even just a couple people. But they push like so many people in there that you have no room to move and you're just stuck in there. And oh, my God, that gets to me so terribly. 
Uh, so yeah, I, I I don't know if it's exactly claustrophobia, but that's my thing. It's just too many well, other people in your space. space. Yeah, yeah, it's I, something. I in that taking thing. all my oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> I do I feel that. At, no. I feel that at concerts a lot indoors, where like I mm -hmm. feel like there's not enough air in the room for how many people are squeezed together in there, oh. and I've never been able to figure out whether that's a psychological thing that I'm feeling because it feels physical, like it feels like I'm genuinely struggling to breathe, and yeah. or, or it or it is genuinely that I am more sensitive to you know breathing other people's air or the heat or something else like that. I have no idea. It might just be psychological. It might be a form of you know something adjacent to claustrophobia, possibly. That's interesting. <laughs> And for me, it's just a lot of sensory as well, because everybody's talking and moving and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's just, there's so many things happening that then it becomes, mm -hmm. oh my God, I'm never getting out of here. You know? <laughs> so, um, I mean, but, yeah, these... or not, I think it's still, you know, whether or not we would feel it in that way, it still begs the question if you were, you know, if for any reason imaginable, if you had to go into a series of tunnels underneath a graveyard would you <laughs> oh i would nope the fuck out instantly i would Even go rob somebody's no house claustrophobia whatsoever <laughs> is there any reason why you could be persuaded to go down there well it's it's no? just like the the <laughs> i guess the previous episode the the uh lot 36 mm -hmm. the idea that the desperation of this person is driving them to do yeah. something that they would not otherwise do oh, yeah. um now he's he's comfortable uh uh, Masson is comfortable with going into the graveyard, obviously, because he's a curator um, and and taking from these bodies. Yeah, he's comfortable uh, with touching the bodies he oh, yeah. and he handles them. That part doesn't actually hold any fear for him, which I found super interesting. And I think more than the other character from the previous episode, he's even more of a representation of like maybe generational or at least lifelong poverty because I feel like in the previous episode we had this veteran who came back and got abandoned and was like desperate and doing ridiculous things to make money but there was this sense that this wasn't maybe necessarily always mm. his lot in life whereas right. with Mascon it feels not only like he's in poverty and desperate now but like he has been this way for eternity and you know ever since he was born it is so normal to him everything he does the way he moves the way he talks everything just screams this is all like this is just life this isn't even mm -hmm. weird i'm not even upset about this right well even where he lives like the the idea that he's living in a in a boarding house mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. not saying that that wasn't uncommon but you think that with that type of position he would have had something else but mm -hmm. you know the boarding house that it was it was obviously very run down uh you had mixed company you had it being used you know as you would in those boarding houses being mm -hmm. used from from di different people from different professions yep. uh and different backgrounds yep. whereas he i don't know he he almost has an air of himself where he's he's in denial about his situation mm -hmm. um because of the way he talks about himself and the way that he tries to carry himself as if as if he has more going on than he actually yeah. does. And which, it's which... like if if he was a grave robber, if he had been for a while, which clearly again he had been, he's so comfortable doing this and it's just completely normalized in his brain. Technically, even just a couple of sets of jewelry should have set him up with a mm -hmm. better starting out condition than that. For them mm -hmm. not to do that, it means that by the time he got them, even by the time he got the first ones, he had already been in serious debt long before then. And it's just putting band-aids over band-aids over band-aids over a problem that's been there for a much longer time. And there was, you know, probably never ever any chance of getting out of. Well, he could have even gotten to a point where he was okay and then gambled to make more and mm -hmm. fucked himself up more, you know, like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I do think his backstory would be absolutely fascinating to see just even the way he carries himself. It's very, it, it seems like he's had a different life before all of this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like compared to the other grave robbers, for instance. 
That's true. Yeah. It is interesting how he's very uh, setting himself apart from them and very different from them. That is fun. Although I always, I might be totally wrong in this, but I always sort of felt like it was a ruse, like it was an act. Mm -hmm. Like he was just better at acting the part than anybody else. That's it. I never believed his act that he came from any sort of superior situation earlier. But that's just guesswork. I have no like no, I, more definitive reason to believe that. I can that. totally see that. That makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> yeah. There is something about of the actor about him, of the way he speaks, right? The way he moves, his facial expressions. Mm -hmm. There's like that sort of thespian vibe coming off of him. So yeah, I just always interpreted it like he's playing a, um, an act for himself, probably, you know, to cheer himself out of this situation, if nothing else. Because like nobody in his context cares, right, that he speaks more eloquently or that he has these, you know, more eloquent ideas. Nobody actually cares. That doesn't make any difference to his bookies. It doesn't make any difference to the people he's servicing. It certainly doesn't matter to the dead. So that's why I sort of always imagined he was just doing it for himself. I like that a lot. Yeah, and then you have the juxtaposition between him and the bookie where he's like, uh, you need to get this money to me. It was almost became mm -hmm. just the the polar opposites as far as the the enunciation mm -hmm. uh and, and the way and the and the usage of vocabulary as well mm -hmm. is is another thing that really stood out because um like you said it, it's it's the it's an aspect of him trying to present himself as something that he's not and maybe that's a coping mechanism maybe that's him masking for everyone around him um you know it, it's 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 an interesting way to present oneself yeah when you don't have to at any rate one thing i can probably safely say about him is that he's not presented to us as a bad person in any way he's presented to us as a person who's making some dumb choices maybe but mm -hmm. not like fundamentally a bad person not like the previous episode for sure yeah because even when he's explaining he said i had a bad run at the card table mm. or i you know i i bet yeah had a bad uh run at the card table as i never do that and and this is basically how i am now so you know you get you mm. get that sense that it's desperation as opposed to that's his character Mm -hmm. it, it, that's that's driving all these decisions. It is definitely uh, it's a hard one to even talk about because it's so real in some senses. When you think about how hard it is once somebody ends up or is born in a situation of poverty, how incredibly horrifically hard it is to ever get out of it, how much the deck is mm -hmm. stacked against you. And mm -hmm. how ugly the process is, even if you do get out of it. Like that process is going to be ugly. There is not going to be anything graceful and legal <laughs> and easy and safe about it. There is no option in which that really happens, not to most people. Right. So in a way, it, it, it just feels like a very normal like you know, story of what happens in life all the time. He's just a guy that's doing some ugly shit because he has to do it. Yeah. I uh I gotta say though, when the bodies ripped into the tunnel, I, I would have just left. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not I'm not going in. I'm uh yeah, no. <laughs> so there are many things when you that say, you still when you say he's making the, in there, to be fair, yes. <laughs> when you say he's making some some rough choices. I don't think I'd make that one. I think I'd go rob somebody's house or I would, uh, you know, like I'm doing something out in the open, the, the tunnels. No, no. That we got to remember his issue was the, was the rats. So for him, yeah. it's like the rats keep stealing the bodies. The rats keep stealing mm -hmm. the bodies as opposed to, you know, when we get first get introduced to him where it's obviously other grave robbers are there and he yeah. uses his, his, uh, oh, I mean, obviously has a gun to help him, but he uses his wits to uh, get them to leave where it's like, hey, you know, by the way, I, I don't think this is a good mm -hmm. idea. Pow. Uh, leave. Mm -hmm. So he may see the body disappearing. It's the shock factor and kind of the jump scare for us as viewers. Yeah. But for him, you still have that. They're just fucking rats. Yeah, that, that's all I'm dealing with. Off. They're just rats. He's just pissed off at that situation. Yeah. Also, I, I think that to, to some degree, um, 
you know, in the other episode, I said that I totally understood why he would do the things he did, because for that amount of money, not only would I do them, but I'd do them naked. In this yes. episode, I feel like I wouldn't go down there. There's no universe in which I would, not even for that amount of money. But I also do recognize that we are dealing with a gambler. So there is right, some aspect right. of addiction in there, right? There is some aspect of a jackpot that he's waiting for. And it's a big payoff. And you can Ooh. see it in the way the actor sort of behaves in his facial expressions. There's something there, right? There's there's a, a gleam in his eye that's speaking to sort of that addiction of winning. Yeah, needing to win. Yeah. Wow. No, I love that. Jeez. I'm sure I'm sure that that's part of a huge part of his motivation. And I think it was acted really well, like really, really well to transmit that without ever having to tell us so. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you also hit, um, you know, he knows about the rats. So this isn't like a surprise when they pop up mm -hmm. like it would be for me. Uh, but also like he, he lives in a in a different time than me. Maybe this is totally normal for him that he's been dealing with rats in different places and and it wouldn't affect him the same way it would me where if there's like a single mouse, I'm the one on the chair screaming for someone else to kill it, you know? So, um, or take it outside. I don't care. Just get it the fuck away from me. But yeah, so. <laughs> uh, okay. I used to be that person too, until I had to actually deal with a very dramatic mouse slash rat infestation after I just bought this house. So funnily mm -hmm. enough, I had a horrific mouse rat infestation. I just moved into this new place and there was like scurrying inside the walls. It was just so bad. And I did. I, I used to be that person who was just terrified of them. So I didn't sleep for weeks and it was just such a nightmare, absolute horror story. Now I'm at the point where I no longer have any sort of care in the world. I will just do what I need to do, get rid of them. Um, but I, I, I sort of, feel like there is one question that we're all dancing around because there's no actual answer to it and it's that no matter how used to rats you are okay no yeah, matter yeah. if you eat your dinner with rats every single night how big would those fucking things have to be to drag a whole corpse away like did you think the rats unionized what did you think was happening there <laughs> that's not rats in, how, what no right on the contrary, the more familiar you are with rats, the more you know that that's not a thing that happens with them. So I, like, I would be terrified if they dragged my dog away, let alone an entire human body. That's not... So yeah, we just never ask that question and he never asks that question. <laughs> and that's where I sort of have to justify it by going, okay, he's a gambler because there's no other reason why anybody would just mm -hmm. ignore that reality. <laughs> But come on, that is not rats. That's just that's that's not normal rats. In, in, no, if they did that, I would let them have the house. <laughs> just move. I wouldn't even. Sell I think it they would take the house. You're not going to have to. You're not. You're not handing you're anything. Right. They're right. going to move it down the street. Right. It's you're just right. gone. Like in what universe do we still believe that these are just regular old rats? Well, I mean, I, there is that I, point when we realize it's not regular old rats. Yeah, <laughs> or at least very true. He just doesn't think about that for a good long time. Yeah, but it's I, I don't know, it's, it's again, you you pointed out very well that the the aspect of him being a gambler playing into this decision. Um, but even beyond that, there is still that idea of I've got one week to make this happen. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. That should have been like, you know what? As you're saying, James, you see that body get pulled away, gambler or not, I'm not going in there. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. people die every day. People are going to be buried in the cemetery pretty routinely. Uh, yeah. But I guess you can also counter that with here's a, a, a genuine score that he has where he knows the guy has these medals. He had some wealth. Um, you know, he had he had all those gold teeth and he had the sword. So there's the opportunity. But Sometimes you just got to cut your losses. But then again, mm -hmm. as yeah. you point out, out, he's a gambler. He's so. an addict. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting if you think about it, how often in horror movies we see the situation where people have to be 
faced with the horror because they can't afford financially not to, right? That's a classic mm. in haunted house horror. They just bought the house or leased it or whatever with their last money. And if they take a loss now, that's it. It is over. They can't even do it, right? That is right. such a classic. And it does kind of beg the question, is it because it's easier to cause horror onto people who are poor it is isn't it it is harder to create horror situations to wealthy well-connected people who have access to whatever the hell they want to have access to it is a lot easier to throw somebody into these situations when they don't have any other way out of them you just mm -hmm. sparked uh something that came up a few days ago when they were talking about money mm -hmm. uh it was some program I was watching or, uh, but they were talking about poverty and they said, you know, money, money isn't everything, but when you're poor, it is everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And when, when whoever said, I, I, I just sat there and I was like, I'm going to keep this in, in my mind because you can see that even when it comes to the way that somebody's life is conducted and what they worry about, um, you know, you pick a billionaire, pick a multimillionaire, right? A, a raise on taxes on them is not going to hurt them. It's not going to change their their uh, their ability to feed themselves or be mm -hmm. fed. But if I am working a job, can fifteen twenty dollars an hour, and I don't get to work the same amount of hours as I did last week, that's going to severely impact that's what I'm everything. able to do for my family, for my life, whatever. Yeah. So you you often have people who do things out of desperation of like, I'm going to lose my house or, um, you know, my kids aren't going to be able to eat, you know, those types of situations. And you have people say, you know what, I will do something illegal or immoral in this moment because I need to survive. Yeah. And that's not something that, you know, people who are even writing those laws understand. Or even the fact that uh, if, if somebody who happens to be in, you know, the working poor or, or lower class themselves, mm -hmm. if they use drugs, you understand the closer you are to those people, you understand why they would be doing it as opposed to somebody who's got billions of dollars and millions of dollars. Like you're doing it for fun. These people mm -hmm. are doing it for escape. Yeah, absolutely. And it is astonishing how we we don't often think about it or realize how many problems on a day-to-day -day basis, like practical, real-life things, money just solves in mm -hmm. five minutes that not having that money changes your entire experience of just existing on this planet, right? Yep. And we're talking even short of actual, like, breadline, short of hunger, right? Let's yeah. say people who can provide for themselves in that sense roof bread okay sorted but still you get to the point where you know something breaks uh you know the electricity goes down something happens in the house and suddenly you're without power or water you're without heating your heating breaks down in the middle of winter you just have thousand dollars to throw at the problem the problem is gone you mm -hmm. do not have that money. That problem becomes your life. It becomes your person for the next, mm -hmm. who knows, month until you've managed to somehow probably learn how to fix it yourself, <laughs> right? That problem now becomes a full-time job. That problem takes hours out of your day, finding solutions, finding ways to raise the money, finding people who can help you for cheaper, learning how to do it yourself. That just becomes a part of your life. And then when you add all of these things up, because realistically, every single day, one of these things happens, right? Mm -hmm. Add all of these up and just by being less wealthy than somebody else's, just being alive is two extra jobs time-wise that they don't have to perform, that they can spend doing anything else, that things that they then boast about as being goals in life, you know, spending more time with their families, going on vacations, uh, going to cultural events, going to the opera, you know, that's life goals. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I still have a broken heating system in the middle of winter and I cannot just yep. throw money at it. And that's going to be my family, my opera and my vacation for the next three months. And it's just astonishing how much it changes 
even before you get to the point of talking about hunger or debt collectors coming to crack right. your knees open. So then getting to that point, that has to be a whole other alien universe that I have the privilege of not knowing that level. And I can't even imagine what living like that must be like. Because I'm already an anxious person. The thought of having all of those added problems, I don't think I would even sleep anymore. <laughs> I would just crash into a coma every couple of days when my body would force me. But other than that, I would not actually naturally sleep. And it just changes everything about who you are. So whenever we talk about characters like him, I feel like we have to make allowances for the fact that whatever decisions he's making, he's making them on little to no sleep, probably hunger mm. who knows what he's eaten the last time he ate what he's been eating for who knows how long what sort of anxieties he has what untreated diseases he has right for all we know everything under the, under those clothing is decomposing and it's not exactly I'm like he's that, making right. decisions from a position that we are talking about them right now in our comfortable chairs and our comfortable right. room so in his case, I definitely feel like, yeah, whatever the fuck he's deciding to do, I mean, just deprive me of sleep for three days, I will do dumber shit than that. Honestly, oh. I have. <laughs> you deprive definitely. me of sleep for too many hours and I'll do dumb <laughs> shit. Or maybe I just blame all my dumb shit on that. It's possible. I don't know. That is the zone in which horrible decisions happen for me. And like exactly when I was having the rat infestation, the mouse and rat infestation problem, apparently sometimes they come together. I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, they, they're friends. They get along. When I was having those issues, I did go through like not sleeping for multiple days. And I can assure you, bad decisions were made, you know, aside from just the general grumpiness and ruining of relationships and being unable to perform my job properly which then causes you to lose more money because I'm a freelancer. So for me, productive work hours means money. No productive mm. work hours means not getting paid. Right. And that is the scary sort of zone where you realize that everything does depend on you being ultimately more or less able-bodied, right? Having mm -hmm. slept, having been fed, being safe, and being relatively in a position where you can work. And then the moment that's gone, that starts to be interesting. So yeah, I, I didn't think that this episode was that deep until I started talking about it. And now I'm like, yeah, no, that's a whole thing. Like it's easy, it's easy to look at it and say it's about the rats. And then you think about how long has it been since this guy has slept properly? <laughs> yeah. I mean, because you'd have to do your job during the day and then you're mm -hmm. doing this at night. Mm -hmm. and, and this is extraneous work. If he didn't have these... Uh, these other grave robbers already digging it up at the beginning. He's got to do it normally yeah. and put it all back to make it look nice. And Matt, have you ever tried to dig a grave? It is not easy. Not that I would know I, personally. My lawyer suggested that I never talk about that. I'm just extrapolating <laughs> from like digging, digging raspberry bush beds and tree beds, but like just digging something up big enough to put a tree in is so hard. It is I, I'm going to tell you, yeah, I, I mean, I haven't, um, sure. not that I haven't thought about digging no, up, uh, digging a grave, but um, if you need yeah, a good I, attorney, I was, Bridget D. Brave is out there, but uh, <laughs> oh. I know she does good, <laughs> good work. Um, but yeah, just, just from gardening, like you said, Alex, like I'll, I'll go plant some stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll dig up a, a garden bed. I'll do what I need to, to, to plant some stuff that I, mm -hmm. I want to see in a, in, you know, in a couple of months and then eventually forget and then they all die. But, <laughs> but that is, that is a pain. And, and you're yeah. talking about digging six feet into the ground and not a yeah. hole. You're talking about digging up the plot. Yeah. So there's multiple there's times no a week telling. on top yes. of your existing job. And then when he does probably get time off to, to, to sleep, you know, probably late mornings, um, the house is freezing for five months of the year. It probably dripping all over the place. Mm -hmm. Goodness only knows what noises go on in there at night. Or even in the morning when he would be sleeping, right? What noises would be happening around him? It's like, I, I know it's so weird to be obsessed with, with this guy's quality of sleep, but I feel like as writers, a lot of us probably relate to those struggles. 
Well, so I, just, I love that we're two episodes in and we are so obsessed with the backstories of these people. And yes. man, if, yes. the, if that's not finding my tribe, I don't know what is. I was so. say that, and that's, that's <laughs> this conversation. That's the, the, the storytelling component that, you know, the, these people put together to where it's not, we're not giving you all the answers, but we're giving you enough to where you're going to speculate yeah. about this. And the thing is, the speculation is not a wrong avenue to go down or a wrong yeah. hole to go into, but it's, it's something that is, it's giving you a little bit more, if not a lot more mm-hmm. uh, connection oh, okay. with those stories. Yep. I hope, I, I really hope that if the writers of these heard us talk, they would be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> to hear how obsessed we are about them. Absolutely. That, that can they, only be look, They'd probably respond with like, no, nah, we just made this guy somebody who needed some money. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell us. Listen, if if any of the writers hear any of these episodes, please just don't tell us. It's fine. We don't need to yeah. know. Let us have our imaginations. And, oh, and go really ahead and cool tag and them all. Mm-hmm. Tag them all on whatever app they left Twitter and went to. And, uh, <laughs> let them know about this. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, actually, to mention uh, Twitter in the context of this episode that's so heavily on, you know, job security, poverty, and that sort of thing. Because, you know, as much of a joke as it is to us, and it is, I make fun of the collapse of Twitter constantly. But then if you think about it, a lot of especially freelancers, artists, Mm -hmm. were kind of depending on that. and. You know, I've seen also my work rate go down a fair bit, even though I was relatively well established already. But I did get so much, so many connections and so many clients through that community. And that's all gone now. And it's not going to be easily replaced. And then coupled that with like yesterday, Patreon had an entire freaking blip where they just dropped for every single person. Mm -hmm. Piles and piles of people who had subscribed to pay. And it's not as easy as saying, oh, Patreon had a blip, please resubscribe, because you would have to reach those people in the first place and remind them, and they would have Mm. to still want to. And like that's the whole point of subscriptions, not having to ask them every single month to do it all over again, right? Right. You have to be able to reach them to find them. They would have to hear about it. They would have to remember. They would have to want to do it again, which would have been a lot easier if social media wasn't collapsing at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Really it's starting to feel like this whole period of time where we've moved from having just a plague to a plague and a climate crisis to a plague, a climate crisis. And your livelihood is kind of just an afterthought to these tech bros who don't genuinely actually care whether you're going right. to be able to be able to do it or not. So it's absolutely is crazy how dependent we are yeah. on on these sites and corporations just doing their shit enough to make it work not even not even doing a great job just keeping it maintaining it yeah. you know and mm-hmm. to them it's... your your entire ability to to have food on the table is a statistical error yep it is just a glitch in a program it means absolutely nothing it's a number and that's your whole life the disparity has got to be becoming clearer to people every single day than it, than it used to be. Like it has to, people have to be waking up to this. I refuse to believe otherwise. Well, even uh, when Twitter became X, I made a post basically saying oh. goodbye to Twitter. And I knew a lot of my friends would make jokes and, and make fun of it, but I was very, very mm-hmm. serious. Like this podcast would not exist without Twitter because yeah. Twitter drove our traffic. Like, I mean, we we seriously dropped, I, I don't even know, more than 1,500 downloads a day because of how X, well, even before X, as soon as Elon took over, how he changed the algorithms. Oh, we yeah. lost that much connect, connectivity with people and uh, and just being able to get the episodes out there and that kind of stuff. And yeah. And so I look at that where we're barely monetizing, like we were doing basically enough to cover the servers and stuff. And, uh, and then I look at my friends who get all of their livelihood from yeah. mm. social media by freelancing, whether they're writers or artists or whatever. And, and I mean, it sucks to lose that many downloads, but it doesn't hurt us. You know, mm-hmm. like right. it doesn't, it doesn't actually affect us 
Um, but, but for those people, like, I just feel so fucking horrific for them and there's yeah. no, there's no good option. Even no, everything that's popped up, everything no. that's popped up, there's been like six, no. seven different options now yeah. and they all have like a piece, but like nobody can get it right. And I don't know, man, I, I don't know how this is going to, I don't know how people are going to keep going when they just depended on that that interface with their customers yeah. right i mean not to not to, to eulogize twitter but <laughs> in, in a way it's fitting to be doing this on this specific episode but my entire career would not exist without it it's how i started off freelancing as an editor it's how i got mm -hmm. my all of my initial pool of freelance clients it's how i met um writers it's how i found places to be published it's how I eventually submitted my story to Matt at Tenebrous Press. It's how we met each other and how I became an editor for Tenebrous Press. It's how mm -hmm. I got my book deal. All of it, every single aspect of what is consuming my entire being now happened because we had a space in which to do that, because we had a space in which to connect with people that we didn't know. And because we had a space to talk about our stuff to people who didn't know us. And that was amazing. Right. And it's going to be so weird if that's gone. <laughs> Especially for an independent press who does kind of need people to buy books. So, hey, Absolutely. if you're listening to this episode, buy some books. <laughs> it doesn't 100%. even matter if your TBR pile is miles high. It doesn't matter. It's a collection. You don't have to read everything. Just buy books. Trust us. I've, I've actually i've started a new one called my to be looked at pile and uh, <laughs> and it's it's made me feel so much better about it i'm like look at you this cover that. isn't this gorgeous and it's, it's gorgeous. not even ai it's great yeah. <laughs> it's okay to have books that you're just going to put on the coffee table out for other people to look at too you're not just buying books for yourself hopefully you are curating a collection that you are going to be able to tell other people about maybe people in your family will want to pick it up maybe you will be giving stuff to your friends every now and then or setting up a little library outside you know there are tons of things you could be doing with books so True. and this is not this is not because i have a vested interest in people buying books or anything <laughs> <laughs> but i feel like that that used to be a thing right people were way more comfortable about just collecting books whether or not they were going to read them people had entire libraries rooms full of wall to wall uh -huh. books that they never expected themselves to actually have to read every single one of they were just there in case you needed them, in case you wanted them, in case you could give them to somebody else or loan them to somebody else. And you were sort of curating something bigger than yourself. And I definitely encourage people to go back to that sort of attitude, especially if we want to keep, you know, indie publishing alive and keep writers. I, I would love to say in the money, but they're already not making that much money. So mm -hmm. <laughs> in the hope, keep them in the hope. Exactly. Plus, you never know when you're going to want to read it. You know. Oh yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually kind of surprised sometimes when I finally read a book. I'll be like, oh, I bought this seven years ago, and mm -hmm. I don't know why, but today's the day, and it's here. Yeah. So let's do it. That happens to me with music all the time too. I'll be like, I've been circling around this band for six years. I only just listened to it now. Oh, I love it actually. <laughs> And nice. then you go research everything that e all the members had been in, who they're associated with, who they played yep. with. Yes. Hopefully not find out that they're complete assholes and horrible right. human beings. Fingers crossed. And definitely make sure they're not robbing people's graves. So <laughs> <laughs> There are worse things people could be doing at this point in time. Oh, <laughs> really? you're true. true. Especially <laughs> famous artists. Listen, I'm willing to forgive them a lot. The bar is so low right now. Don't actively be encouraging people not to get vaccinated is good enough for me. Mm -hmm. like, that's it. The bar is very, yeah. very low. Definitely. I do I do wonder, speaking of vaccinations, I do wonder if our, our main character would be an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> he sure seems to have like a very um laissez-faire attitude to health and safety at his workplace, doesn't he? He doesn't give a crap. Well, I mean, he want them, to be fair, I mean, it is he'd the want 1920s. Them to die. Yeah. <laughs> he, 
I think he would he would do, he would get the vaccine, but he would not he would not advocate for other people because it's 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 a way that he could make money. Oh, that's interesting. Yep. Well, and I don't mean as far as like he would just talk to certain people he knows who have money and say like, man, I, you know, I don't think that this would be a good idea. We the Muslims have always mm-hmm. understood. You know, uh-huh. I could I could see him just uh-huh. completely putting on airs to to uh-huh. get somebody. Oh not yeah, I to see do that. It. I see that totally. Actually, you can probably answer this question for me. Um, in that time period, how familiar would people have been? People like him would have been with. Things like you know rabies, tetanus, all of that stuff. Uh, fairly, because you're you're talking about, and, and again, I'm I'm going with the 1920s as far as yeah. the, the time period in which this is done. So you're coming away from the the what was what was then called the the Spanish flu, the influenza scare of of 1919 through 20. Um, there were people that were because pre- i was looking at some newspapers and james ha- had to listen to me talk about this this one little piece of gem i found gem i found but there were people advocating to take the vaccine like because uh, i was looking at newspapers in phoenix arizona and the doctors were holding meetings with their churches and different groups that they belong to advocating and saying like you need to take the vaccine uh, because it's going to protect you from mm-hmm. from this and they had vaccine drives. Now you did have a good number of anti-vaxxers of uh, at, at, during that period, as well as anti-maskers like, like mm-hmm. we've had and seen. Um, but at least for the most part, there was a, there was a general public support of vaccinations. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, that's pretty really cool to know. It does put things into context because Again, he has a very like relaxed attitude. I mean, I would be concerned about rabies. I don't even know how realistic my concern is in that context, but I would at least worry about it. And it seems like he has absolutely zero worries there. So that means that if in that historical context, they did know about it and did know about curing things like that and treating and preventing things like that, then it, it speaks even further to his sort of addiction as a gambler, to how much that drive supersedes any sort of fear for personal safety. Because like rabies is a scary disease. I, I was reading about it recently because of my mouse and rat infestation, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it is terrifying. Like by the time you know you've got rabies, you're basically dead. Yeah, because wow. they... The the rabies vac- rabies vaccine had been out because uh, it was polio that didn't come out until the the fifties, mm, but the rabies yeah. vaccine was like in the late nineteenth century. So I mean, it's it's something oh. that, I mean, especially the way that this guy presents himself, he presents himself himself as someone who has a little bit of understanding of the world and what's mm-hmm. going. Like he doesn't seem like a completely cut off um, individual. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's it. It's got to be something even stronger. That's compelling him to behave the way he does then you said it he's a gambler he's desperate (laughs) (laughs) i love these little details and it's nice to it's nice to be able to get facts about the historical context because that's stuff that often when i'm watching stuff i'll think about it and wonder oh i wonder if that's accurate or i wonder if that's happened already and then i'll forget to look it up by the time it's finished (laughs) so it's good to get to talk about this stuff and ask. I love it. I, I think that uh, th- we miss so much stuff in different, uh, whether it's books or movies or anything, just because we don't know that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. anytime we have these conversations, oh, even yeah. when I think I know things, Don teaches me a ton or, <laughs> uh, you know, just different guests have just taught me so many different mm-hmm. things. And it's made me honestly like things i didn't like the first time i watched them because yeah. having that context shifts things and it does. i just adore that there is this effect that happens a lot in art where the more you understand something the more you'll be able to find enjoyment in it you know even if it it's not always like we treat movies like they're always supposed to be instantly love or hate that's sort of what social media has pushed us towards oh yeah that we either immediately love it or we don't and that is the end of the discussion and i don't think i i, I guess we also probably treat books and music more and more like that as well and i don't think that was always true it definitely wasn't always true for me like i'll remember starting a book oh gosh i think it was called 
grass. It was Sherry S. Tepper and somebody else. Um, I've started that book 15 times. And I always wow. stopped after like the first chapter because it was so dense with like historical information about this fictional planet and their, you know, bureaucracy and hierarchy of the social ladder and stuff. It was just so dense. I never managed to read it. It was also a time when I didn't have access to that much variety of books in English. I was pretty young. So then I kept trying and I kept trying. Eventually, I burst past that second chapter and just devoured the whole thing in two nights because it was actually a really interesting and fantastic book. And like now I feel like, especially with movies, we're treating them as though they have to impress us immediately or else it is completely mm -hmm. over. They are shit, throw them in the bin. Mm. And that's not what's happening at all. That That's not how they work at all. The more you understand something, the more you think about it, the more you talk about it. I'm not saying it's going to turn every single thing into a gem. That's also not possible. Yeah, Some stuff is just never going to work for you. And that's totally okay. Like we get to hate certain movies. That's so fine. Um, but yeah, a lot of times it's going to help you really enjoy something better sometimes watching something the third time or listening to a piece of music the third time is going to be when you finally get it and love it right i hope i certainly hope we don't completely lose that ability although i do fear it's kind of happening but yeah i definitely oh, yeah. love graveyard rats more now than i did the first time <laughs> i saw it <laughs> well especially I think, uh... with that that ending though you know i mean we we've skipped over some stuff as far as like yeah. the the the, like all of the it. body <laughs> no no but i mean these are these are thematic stuff thematic things but there's some great yeah. visuals in this because mm -hmm. oh, um, yeah. until i messaged james the other day about this i forgot about the rats coming out of his mouth you yeah. know when, which oh, yeah, that's oh, a good oh great visual I mean, but morbid visual. But it's a great visual to drive home. Like one, he's gone, and then two, yeah. uh, you know, to to you know, let you know that that the rats have consumed yeah. another person. He's gone, but the graveyard isn't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, it's fun when you said it great visual. I wasn't sure if you're going to say great or gross because either of those completely. <laughs> Excuse me. Impactful visual. <laughs> <laughs> You know, for me, it wasn't even the crawling out of the mouth, but I did write down and I was like, oh my God, this scene is so good. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, uh, it was the way the mouth expands before yeah. the rat can come out. That's what really got to me. And it yeah. takes a lot for horror to gross me out or make me react. And, and that one totally did. And that's what it was. It was the mouth having to expand because the rat was bigger than the mouth. That was yeah. ugh, so I think for me, so it's even before and, that. It's, it's when the body moves before the mouth even mm -hmm. opens. Like there's this whole body shudder going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that that has to do like with the, the, the folk tales and scary stories I was always growing up with. But for me, it's like immediately, okay, I'm dead. That's immediately where my brain goes. When the body is dragged away, if you are a Romanian person, you think, okay, I'm dead. When he moves, you think, okay, I'm dead on some level. That's just such an instinctive fear. It's like seeing the, the outline of a wolf in the woods. You mm. immediately yeah. have a reaction to it. So when his body moved, it's like they were flirting with it. They were. I know that they were flirting with it. They were flirting with suggesting for just a brief second that he was something that wasn't entirely dead. Even if afterwards it turned out to just be the rats. Right. I like that. I felt like they were flirting with me personally. Even though the claustrophobia didn't get me personally, even though I'm immune to the whole rat thing by now, that bit got me. What did you think of the uh, supernatural, whatever the hell that thing is? Like, did you guys think it was necessary? Or do you think the rats was enough? Or did it add to it for you or what? For me, I thought it was good to have it thrown in there because you now combine all these fears. You got claustrophobia. You've got the rats, right? You got the darkness. Now you have the the dark church of the black church uh, that he references early on, where he talks about, oh yeah, mm -hmm. in Salem there were all these the tunnels under this. But the fact that this legend that he's talking about, he realizes that it's true, 
And in his sense of like, oh, here are all these objects, here's all this gold and these things that are here, uh, jewelry that I can go ahead and take. The the fact that he understood the story, but didn't, I'm sorry, he knew the story to where he shouldn't have messed with what he messed with at that yeah. point. If he had known that the black church really existed, he would have known the stories behind it and been like, I'm not touching any of this. I'm not, I'm not going to touch the talisman. I'll take the other stuff, but I'm not going to touch that. Yeah. Um, which again, I, I guess I've been I've been ruined by Indiana Jones movies since I need to reference that one again, where you know even Indy's like, no, 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 we don't we don't mess with that. That's obviously not <laughs> Jesus's cup. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Man. how do you how do you make an addict deny taking the jackpot once he sees it? Like there was no other sure. way for him. There was no there was never any other option. I do like the supernatural element. I love how it's never like deeply explained or explored on in any sort of sense mm -hmm. it just is there and i think that's what it needed because we already have the rest of the story in place we already have all the elements we need but the fact that there's just something more that's probably always been there out of sight mm -hmm. and most of its history continues to remain out of sight for us and the whole thing will continue to remain out of sight for everybody else there you know it's not going to affect them in the least that is like one of those fundamental things of horror like we were saying in the other episode you know it, it's not just the darkness it's what might be there when it shouldn't or at the beginning of this one actually mm -hmm. um, and, and i love that it exists there and i love how it was done it was just grazing against the unknown and the supernatural having you know the visual impact of it and then that's it it's done it's gone back into the shadows you know until the next fucker yeah <laughs> i think my uh my favorite thing in this isn't isn't the rats and it isn't the zombie whatever the hell that thing is it's the dumbest decision that he makes and it's shooting his own foot i i <laughs> love this scene I love how I can absolutely understand why he would be dumb enough to do it. And I love that he doesn't know what angle he's at properly. Mm -hmm. But also, I rewound this like four times and watched it. And it looks so good. Just just blowing his the, the top of his foot off is so good. Oh, gosh, I don't no, know. I, see it again. <laughs> It just it looks great. That sort of feeling of adding insult to injury, like everything is going wrong enough. We didn't technically mm -hmm. need for this to also be a thing. And it's just so offensive <laughs> that on top of everything else, this happens. Well, the other thing yeah. I like about it is this is one horror where you can shoot your foot and it doesn't matter because uh -huh. you're almost never going to put your weight on it. You're almost uh -huh. never going to need to walk it's or run. True. Right. It's true. And so it works really well. You don't have uh -huh. to worry about forgetting about it and making the character do something they shouldn't do. You know, uh, but what were you going <laughs> to say, Don? Oh, I was going to say that the other thing, I guess, a, a sense of anxiety that that the filmmakers put in this is after he shoots his foot. And there's that other rat that he missed, the, the, the rat that bit him initially. Mm -hmm. uh, the rat starts sniffing the air. And my thought is, oh, no, <laughs> the rat yeah. smells the blood. <laughs> yeah. And this is going to be the end because I typically mm -hmm. don't look at the the timing of things mm -hmm. um, to, to, to determine like, oh, it's got five minutes left. There's going to be a resolution or it's this is happening. The, the film is over. The, the show is over. And so I immediately thought like, Okay, well, the rats are going to attack him right now. And for him, whether he realized or not that the rat was smelling him and then taking that moment to shoot the rat that could smell him, whether he intentionally did this as the character, intentionally did this or not, I thought that was a, a really good point of anxiety to throw mm -hmm. in yeah. where it's as a viewer, you look at it and think, oh, shit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It's bad enough you shot yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. Now you're gonna have to deal with all these rats eating it. How about the ending when he's like crawling towards the light? Did you ever actually believe he was gonna make it? No, no, 
<laughs> <laughs> I want, I, I really wanted him to. Is that weird? I genuinely did want him to. Like, I was fully on his side. I wanted him to get out of there. But no, like, I didn't buy that for a second. The more he got excited about it, the less I bought it. <laughs> no, and see, my, my thought was, why is there why is there a bright light up there? Mm-hmm. You know, and it was just when he was shining his flashlight, I'm like, I don't think that's what he thinks it is, mm-hmm. or or it's going to be an even worse situation. Uh, you know, maybe it's you know jewelry that's 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 in one of the holes because you know the rats have been going through the holes, mm-hmm. dropping stuff, and sure. when they've been dragging people. But no, I, I as soon as it happened, I laughed actually. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so I. I didn't need him to die like Nick in the first episode, right? No, no, um, not. If he would have made it out and it would have been, you know, one of those morality tales of he has to sacrifice the treasure to save himself, like, I would have been okay with that. I probably wouldn't yeah. have loved it as much as I love this, but I would have been all right with it. Whereas if Nick made it out in the first one, I would have been like, uh-uh. no, fuck you, uh-uh. Uh-uh. you know? Uh, <laughs> so so I do agree. I, I was sort of rooting for him, but I, I had no doubt that... This wasn't ending the way he wanted. Uh, mm-hmm. I absolutely love how they used the reflective plate for his light. And I thought that was so beautiful, mm-hmm. um, you know, to give him false hope. But, but I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you're running through these tunnels that only the rats have dug. Where the fuck do you think you're coming out at? You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I almost wonder whether that's just more addiction metaphor, more gambling metaphor, you know. The light at the end of the tunnel that you think is there, it's just you shining it. That's ju- it's always just you. There's no jackpot. It's just you hoping for it. Right. That's beautiful. Mm. I love it. <laughs> so I can tell what type of end- endings you like in horror, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I'm pretty predictable. <laughs> I also I just I love anthologies, so mm-hmm. I I feel like I expect a certain ending in order to be happy you know like you, you kind of have to have these uh these lessons even if it's too late to learn them mm-hmm. so yeah i can go either um, way on endings i can totally live with a horror that ends with people surviving and making it out especially if then there's some sort of you know reason why that's actually a bad thing i love really twisty and weird endings i could go either mm-hmm. way i did want him to make it but i knew he wasn't gonna <laughs> Which is very skillful of the writers, I have to say. Good job. Yep. Now this is uh, this is another fun episode. Uh, mm-hmm. I I liked everything about it, but this one feels like such a throwback to uh, you know just other anthologies I loved growing up, and and I found out that they had actually done this as part of a trilogy of Terror Two, which I've never seen. Uh, so I just wanted to know, Don, have you seen that? Wait, there's a trilogy of Terror Two. So you have not seen it. Okay. Good. I have That's not. I, I knew about the first one. I didn't know there was a second one. Neither did I until I found out that they they sort of did this in Trilogy of Terror 2. So huh. there you go. Okay, what do you mean? What there do you should... mean? I, it's just, it's, I, I read a quick synopsis and it's just a little okay. different. Um, you know, well, still, still similar, but, but not, you know. I'm curious. I'll um, have to see that. Yeah, so I just I thought maybe Don had seen it because he's watched a mm-hmm. ton of anthologies, and I was going to ask how similar it was, but I, I this is blown up in my face. No, well, we've, got homework now. <laughs> <laughs> we've all got homework to do. Well, yeah, also now I'm now I'm upset that there's not a third one because there should be a trilogy mm-hmm. of trilogy of ter- you know, like come on, <laughs> yes, seems yes, like so a missed opportunity. Well, I mean, we, the- we do not have <laughs> enough anthologies. Never, never enough. Look, Anymore. the sequel was done in 96, the original mm-hmm. 75. So, I mean, it's... Could, it's time. Yeah, it's overdue. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was going to say, you could go two ways. Either it's not happening or it's overdue. Yeah. Notice we're all just instantly make more anthologies. It's time. Absolutely. It's time. You know, I haven't even checked what the reaction to this one has been. Because I'm sort of afraid because I want it to be really good because I want more of it. Mm-hmm. But also I know how judgmental people are. So ah, I haven't looked to see. Do either of you know how it's been doing? Most of the stuff I've read was pretty positive. Uh, mm-hmm. There is some, yeah. the, it's the same thing you were talking about. I don't know if it was last episode or this episode, but where uh, 
you know, people just instantly have to, ugh, every single one wasn't absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. So it's shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but for the most part, the, uh, the comments I, I give credence to were very positive and the rest were just kind of whiny versus mm -hmm. something actually not being good. Mm -hmm. I sincerely hope that Del Toro can leverage his heft to, to make more of this stuff and to, to feature more people. That would be wonderful. Me too. Well, I guess that about wraps it up. And next week we get to jump in and do the autopsy, the one I've heard the most about. Most of my friends quote this as being their favorite episode. Okay. And I cannot wait to like rewatch this one before we record the next one with my note card in hand to figure out exactly why. Because I love to autopsy a movie <laughs> or an episode. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be performing my own autopsy on this to figure it out. This concludes another episode of the Necronama.com. Join us next week when we look at Cabinet of Curiosities, Episode 3, The Autopsy.